I will bless the Lord at all times. God's praise will continually be in my mouth. So glad that we can come together for worship. Whether you're online or on site, we're really glad to have opportunity to be together today. Let me make two announcements as we get started. First of all, 10 days from now, July 20th, will be Coffee with the Pastor. If you're interested in knowing more about our church or you're interested in uh, becoming a member of our church, Coffee with the Pastor is a place that happens. We'll talk about our mission, our method, our vision for ministry, but also what we expect of those who are members. So if you're interested in coming July 20th, you can sign up on the app or through the website. We would love to know that you're coming. Also, I want to call your attention to how in the bulletin it actually lists a prayer request. This is something that I've been praying for our church for about two years, and periodically I remind you of it, invite you to join with it, and that is, Lord, give us the gift of faith to do what you're calling us to do. We know that sometimes when God calls us to do something, it's very easy. Other times it is very challenging. And so in those moments of challenge, we want God to give us every bit of faith that we need to be faithful to what God's calling us to do. Friends, it's a great day for us to worship. As you're able, let me invite you to stand and let's worship together. Though the tears may fall, my song will rise, my song will rise to you. Though my heart may fail, my song will rise, my song will rise to you. While there's breath in my lungs, I will praise you, Lord. In the dead of night, I'll lift my eyes, I'll lift my eyes to you. When the waters rise, I'll lift my eyes, I'll lift my eyes to you. Heart, I will pray. 
to you with joy in our hearts, and we lift our voices in praise to you, God, for what you've done in our lives. Amen.
please remain standing and uh, join me in affirming our faith together. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? No. In all these things we are more than conquerors through the one who loved us. We are sure that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor things present nor things to come nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in creation will separate us from the love of God. In Christ Jesus our Lord, thanks be to God. Amen. You may be seated. So one of my favorite miracles that we read in the Gospels, and it's, it's actually one... Oh yeah, the children, if you are a child, I knew I was going to forget it. Miss Susan reminded me, Children's Church, head on out and have fun. Thank you for reminding me, Susan. <laughs> so one of my favorite miracles in the Gospels, and in fact, it's, it's one other than the resurrection. It's the only one listed in all four. And it actually happens twice. And it's the feeding of the multitude. right? And, and the two times that it happens, the, the details vary. Right, the, the number of people fed in either um, account changes. The number of loaves of bread that they had and the number of fish that they had changes. Um, the, the number of baskets left over that they collect afterwards change. But in both accounts, in both stories, in both miracles, Jesus gathers what little they have to offer, what's available, and he thanks God for it, and then he actually performs the miracle through the hands of his disciples, and he distributes the food to the disciples who then feed the masses, and, and everyone has all they can eat and more, and then there's leftovers. And what I love about the story is it's a miracle that we continue to see every single day. This isn't just something that happened 2,000 years ago, but Jesus is actually continuing to be in the business of multiplication. He continues to take what we have to offer and multiply it for the kingdom to do incredible things, right? And I imagine that day that the, these two events took place, the disciples had to be thinking, what good can come from these few loaves of bread and fish, right? The, the need is too great. There are too many people, too many mouths to feed. What could Jesus possibly do with what little we have to offer? And Jesus takes it and multiplies it, and you guys know the story, and Jesus is still doing that today. We tend to think, and I know I do at times, what I have to offer just isn't enough. I look at the broken world around us and I think, the need is too great. What are my few cents or my few dollars or my 10%? What could it possibly do? What could it possibly accomplish? And I'm here to say that St. Andrews, thankfully, is an incredible missional church. We are involved in missions throughout the world, not just in our community, not just in our state, but throughout the world. And Jesus, every Sunday, takes what we have to offer, what is available, and he thanks God for it, and he multiplies it, and miracles are happening throughout the world because of our faithfulness and because of God's faithfulness. Um, one of those miracles that I want to highlight is Day Spring. That is a, a camp for high school students that starts tomorrow. We've got 44 high school students and leaders that are going to be meeting here at 9.30 in the morning and loading up on some buses and heading down to Cross Point, which is at Lake Texoma. And they're going to have an incredible week. Uh, I know that God is going to move in powerful ways. And it's through your generosity, it's through your joyful giving that we're able to provide opportunities like that for our students. I myself am a, am a product of Dayspring. My first Dayspring was in 1994, and I've been to over 20 cents. And it's through the ministry and the camp of Dayspring that I received my call into ministry. It took me a while to get there. It took me a while to actually agree to what God was calling me to do. But that's where I first felt God nudge my heart. And I've had over the years countless incredible experiences with Jesus. And I have no doubts that this week our students and our leaders are going to have an incredible encounter with Jesus and are going to come back transformed. And it's through your joyful giving and generosity 
that allows us to send our students to incredible camps like Day Spring. So thank you for your joyful giving and generosity. We have um, multiple ways to, to give and to tithe. There are three giving stations in the sanctuary. We have two up front and one in the back, and you can come up during this next song to give or give on your way out. There's also a QR code in your bulletin that you can scan if you want to give that way. And then for those who are worshiping with us online, you'll see a number on the screen that you can text to give to. Um, a whole lot of ways that we can participate in the miracle that Jesus has for us today. Thank you.
St. Andrews is a loving, caring, overcoming community of faith centered in a relationship with Jesus Christ, and we are a church of prayer. Paul encourages us in Philippians 4, 6 that instead of worrying about anything, we should pray about everything. And so let's do that. Right, let's do that as the church, and as we prepare our hearts to that, you'll see on the screen behind me names that are scrolling, and we know specific prayer needs for some, for others we don't. You may recognize the names of some, others you may not. And I would encourage you that not only should we be praying for them this morning, but be praying through them throughout the week. And if you recognize a name of someone you know, reach out to them this week. Not to say, hey, we prayed for you at church but to say, hey, I would like to pray for you right now. I know that many times in my life I've been guilty of someone saying, hey, can you pray for me? And I say, oh, yeah, sure, thanks. Let me put it on my list and and walk away and miss an opportunity to pray with them in that moment. And so as we pray for them this morning, let's also be encouraged to connect with them this week and to pray with them, if not in person, over the phone. Um, Some people are battling cancer, and so we lift them up. In prayer, we pray for strength. We pray for healing. We lift up the families who are fighting this with them, and we pray that Jesus would give them hope and would help them and would surround them in comfort. We pray for the doctors, that the doctors would be given wisdom and discernment to know exactly what treatment needs to take place in order for them to be healed and restored. We also pray for those that are homebound, those that can't be with us, this morning in person, many of which might be joining us and worshiping with us online. We pray that they would remember how much God loves them and how much we, as the body of Christ, love them, and that they would be comforted in this time where they're, they're homebound. We also lift up our missionaries. We don't just support them financially, but we also lift them up in prayer. And there's lots of things that we can pray for our missionaries, and Surely, protection is one. Some of them may be in some dangerous places and may need God's provision and protection. But what I love in the book of Acts, as the church is praying for those who are being sent out, the church is praying for boldness to share the gospel. And so let's make that our prayer as well for our missionaries, that they would have the boldness to share the gospel with those that are broken and hurting, those that are hopeless and helpless, those that have not heard the gospel and the love and truth of Jesus Christ, that they would have daily opportunities and be bold enough to share Jesus with them. We also pray for those that are deployed. We pray that God would remind them that they're not alone, that God would protect them, that God would lead and guide them. And we pray for their families who are back home and sad and and struggling with the thought and idea of a loved one being far away and possibly in danger. We pray that God would give them a peace and a comfort, um, a peace that surpasses all understanding. Um, And then we also pray for Allison Glover, um, an expectant mother, and we are celebrating and excited for her and the family, and uh, pray that God would bring some cooler weather for her. Pray that... um, Pray that God would guide and protect her and protect that precious baby. And we pray for a happy, healthy baby through all of this. And then I know many of us carry heavy burdens with us. We come this morning with unspoken prayer concerns. And I um, lift those up. I pray that God would um, surround us with people that would pray with us. That we would have those that we can trust and reach out to to share those prayer concerns with and trust that God knows what our concerns are, and will meet us where we are. Um, DA is going to come up in a second and continue our sermon series on creating the church. And it just so happens this morning that he is preaching on prayer. Prayer is a very important aspect of who we are as the church. And, uh, And so as DA comes to share that message, let's lift DA up as well in prayer. Pray with me. Father God, we love you, and we are so incredibly thankful for the ways in which you make yourself evident in our lives, the ways in which you reveal yourself to us daily. We thank you for the ways in which you are at work in the life of this church, through camps, through VBS, through all the different things that you're doing. We are so excited for how you are at work in our lives. Thank you for your goodness, Lord. Thank you for your faithfulness. And this morning, we pray that your will be done across the board in all aspects of our lives. We pray for healing and for miracles in your name and for your glory. 
We pray for reconciled relationships and for boldness and courage to share your love with our neighbors, to share your love with our family members, to share your love with those we come into contact with daily, that we would be bold enough to share who you are with them. We lift Pastor D.A. up to you this morning and ask that you would anoint him and fill him with your Holy Spirit. Speak boldly and clearly through him this morning and prepare our hearts and minds to be transformed by your word and your presence. Thank you for the power and work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Thank you for the gift of your son, Jesus, and for the prayer that he taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. You too? You know, it's hot outside. You don't want to move around much. You're feeling kind of listless. You know, listless is defined as lacking energy or enthusiasm. There's another kind of listless that I sometimes wonder if I will ever get to the point in my life where I can be listless. And that is, I can't live my life without list. You know, I mean, there's some things you do every day or every week, you don't need a list, you know. Take a shower, brush your teeth, make your bed, you know, uh, write a sermon. <laughs> things I don't have to write myself notes to remember. But then there are other things that if I don't write them down, I, I get in trouble. Return a phone call. <laughs> show up at a meeting. Um, write a letter. I, you know, the, you just get in trouble if there's some things you don't do. And so we have to find a way... Uh, to write those things down so we remember them. Of course, you know, somebody told me after the last service, they said, you know, I, I need to put it on my list that I need to make a list. Yeah, we, we get that. We, we, you know, we're task-oriented people. We have things to do. But when I was thinking about lists this past week, I, I thought of two lists that I probably use a lot other than my to-do list, and these are lists maybe that you have too, and I began to wonder what are they, what's alike, what's similar about them, what's different about them, and those two lists are a shopping list and a prayer list. Now, Josh just walked us through the church's prayer list, you know, people that have asked us to pray, people with cancer, people with dementia, people that are deployed or shut in or expecting a, a new baby. He, he walked us through the prayer list. So if you've ever wondered what's a prayer list, that's what a prayer list is. And sometimes I find in my life, and I think it's because I'm a pastor, that uh, people seem to think that I have a written down prayer list. I do not, just so you know that. But they'll call and say, could you add me to your prayer list? And when they do this, I actually receive it as a compliment that somehow, in whatever they're thinking, they believe that I am a mighty warrior in prayer that slays demons and everything. I'm going to tell you all, there's sometimes when I pray, I don't even feel like a conqueror. But I digress. What are the similarities, what are the differences between a shopping list and a prayer list? So I offer this for your consideration. A shopping list. I go to the store for what I need and what I want. When I pray, I go to God for what I need and what I want. When I go to the store and I find something that's on my list, I check it off, mark it out. When I pray, if I were to take something off my list, it would mean that God has brought a resolution for that person or that situation for which I am praying. When I go to the store and I forget something on my list, it is highly inconvenient to have to go back to the store to get it. But when I pray, if I forget to pray for someone or something, it's not at all inconvenient to pause 
and pray again. When I go to the store, if they do not have something that I want or need, I am not happy. In fact, I may not go back to that store again. But when I pray, if God does not give me what I'm asking for, there's not anyone else I'm going to pray to. When I go shopping, my family adds to my list. When I pray, there seems to be a boundless supply of people that are willing to add to my list. When I go to the store, it's because I'm a consumer. I'm going to get things so I can consume them. But when we pray, we are not merely spiritual consumers. We don't give up on God if God doesn't give us the things that we want or the things we do. Again, there's no one else that we're going to go to in prayer. And one of the things that we can appreciate is that when God is creating the church, God creates the church as a place where people gather together so that people can pray. The guiding verse for us over the last few Sundays has been Acts 2.42. I want to invite you to read this aloud with me again because this gives four characteristics of what the early church was like. Would y'all read this with me? All the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper and to prayer. Brothers and sisters, this is the word of the Lord. I would suggest to you that of those four characteristics of the early church that we continue to have today, that prayer is far and above the most intimidating of all four characteristics. Apostles' teaching. Oh, we, we all love to sit at the feet of someone who has been with Jesus, who has experienced Jesus, and can tell us about Jesus, and, and, and we just we soak it in because at that point we're glad to receive what they have. There's nothing intimidating at all about that. Or how about fellowship? Oh, we... Fellowship does not intimidate us. When we live in community, when we live in koinonia, we know and we understand that we live with concern for and dedication to each other's highest good. We are help when people need healing. That does not intimidate us. When we come to the sharing of meals, okay, you bring the bread, you bring the dessert, you bring the casserole. Nothing intimidating about that. We know how to work that because we're Methodist. But there's nothing intimidating about the Lord's Supper either because that's when we remember what Jesus did and what Jesus sacrificed. And in that moment of communion, what it is that Jesus is doing with us and for us and through us and in us in that moment. But we also anticipate and celebrate that he is coming back again and we feast at that heavenly banquet table. That is not intimidating to us. But prayer, and maybe this is based on observation from a you know, few years of ministry. When you're in a meeting, when you're in a group, and someone says it's time to pray, you don't dare make eye contact with whoever is leading at that point. Because if you make eye contact, it could be that you are giving assent, that you are willing to pray. Out loud, so everybody can hear. And most of us really get intimidated by that because we don't always feel like we're at warrior status, maybe not even conqueror status. But brothers and sisters, let's be clear. When God created the church, and when God is creating the church, prayer is a vital and important characteristic of what we do as followers of Jesus. You see, prayer was seen, first of all, as a daily exercise of faith. You've got to remember, and I hope you have picked up on this, because I've said this each of the last three weeks. When we look at the early church, when we look in Acts chapter 2 at what is going on in the church, we understand that these are Jewish converts to Christianity. These are Jews that believe Jesus is both Lord and Messiah. And the Jews had a habit of daily prayer. 
Maybe they were praying the Psalms. Maybe they were praying what they would have considered to be liturgies of their faith, but it was a daily exercise of their faith. In the same way that physical exercise is important to us, our spiritual exercise is important too. Now, I don't know how you like to get exercise, but as a younger man, or dare I say, as a much younger man, when I got exercise, my way of exercising was through team sports. That's what I like to do. I like to get together with friends and play pickup basketball a couple of nights a week. I like to get with friends and go play volleyball a couple of times a week. It was the, the competition and the sport and the camaraderie that we had in those moments. That was how I like to get exercise. But my wife liked to bicycle. She was a cyclist. You go, girl. You knock yourself out. And then we made friends with another couple, and both of them were cyclists, so you know what that meant, right? DA had to go buy a bicycle. And we enjoyed our, our time together, and we decided that we were going to ride in uh, a very large bicycle rally, bicycle race. Perhaps you've heard of it. It's called the Hotter Than Hell 100. Have y'all heard of that? Hotter Than Hell 100. In Wichita Falls, Texas, every August, thus the name. The 100 has to do with the distance. And now that we're all cycling, we're going to train. We're going to get ready to ride in the hotter than hell 100. And you have to get ready for it. For about eight weeks, we went riding every day, increasing the mileage we have. So hopefully we're in peak condition when the day of the ride comes up. Whenever we pray for our daily exercise, for our spiritual exercise, what we're doing is we are now inviting Jesus to be a part of every part of our life. We're inviting him to be involved in our family. We're inviting him to be involved in our job, with our uh, community. We are inviting Jesus to participate in everything we do. When we pray, it is not merely an exercise like a spiritual shopping list. We don't expect Jesus just to take our order and then give us what we want. No, what Jesus invites us to is a relationship where he is involved and he is concerned with how it is we live. We're devoted to prayer. But we also know that prayer is an identifying mark of our discipleship. Again, for Jewish people, the, the, the relationship is rabbi, which means teacher, disciple, which means student. And you could tell which rabbi a person was a disciple of by the way that they prayed. If they heard him pray this certain prayer, they might say, oh, that's obviously one of Rabbi Mordecai's you know, disciples. Or if they prayed in another way, that's Rabbi Isaiah's way of praying. Of all the things the disciples ask Jesus to do, they don't ask, Jesus, can you show us how to do that bread and fish thing so we can feed thousands of people? They don't ask that. Of all the things they ask Jesus to do, they ask Jesus to teach them how to pray. And so Jesus says, okay, when you pray, pray like this. Now, I've got a good friend who's a pastor, and as I was you know, thinking through this particular scripture this week, I said, I'm going to bounce something off of you, and I need you to tell me if I'm a heretic, because he would have gotten great pleasure in telling me if I was being heretical. I said, when we, we read in Acts 2.42 that they were devoted to sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper, you need to know if you go back and read a Greek New Testament. By the way, how many of y'all read one? Okay, so y'all got to take my word for it. You know, if, if you read a Greek New Testament, that's not what it says. The translation is trying to help us understand what is being done. What it says in Greek is they were devoted to breaking bread, sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper was the understanding of that. And so when it says that they were devoted then to prayer, I said, so I'm, I'm putting all this together, they were devoted to the apostles' teaching, and what the apostles are teaching them are the things that Jesus said and did. So it's got to be that when they were devoted to prayer, one of the things the apostles teach them is how to pray 
the prayer that identifies them as a disciple of Jesus Christ. It's got to be that part of how to pray is to pray the Lord's Prayer. And 2,000 years later, when the people of God gather together for worship, what do we do? We pray the Lord's Prayer. And what does it do? It identifies us as a disciple of Jesus Christ. I remember when I was a campus minister, I got a call from the university president's secretary one day. And she was asking if I would be willing to pray at the graduation ceremonies. Well, I thought it was an honor to be asked to do that. I mean, I may not be a warrior, but I have some skills in such situation. And she, you know, was saying, would you do this? I'm like, yeah, I'd be, I'd be honored to do that. I want to represent here. And so she said, okay, uh, let me get some information so we have it for the program. Uh, how do you spell your name? That would be capital D, period, space, capital A. <laughs> My name's pretty easy to spell. But then it's like, well, you know, what's your title? Are you pastor? Are you reverend? Are you father? You know, just kind of stuff like that. And after I give her the information, she's um, saying, okay, well, you need to be at this place at this time, and this is what you're going to do, and this is where you're going to sit. Just giving me the details of it. And the last thing she said was this you need to kind of make it a generic prayer. What exactly is a generic prayer? I mean, I, I, I figure what she was saying was, you know, the whole fact that we're asking you to pray is kind of risky and we don't want to offend people, you know, make, make it just kind of a generic prayer. Friends, I don't pray generic prayers. Because when I pray, I know who I pray to. I don't pray to a generic God. I pray to the God who created the universe and who came down and lived among us in human flesh, and we called him Jesus. And when I pray in Jesus' name, I understand that it is aligning myself and identifying myself with him because I want to do what is pleasing to him, and I want to have a relationship with him, and I want to do the things that he did. When I pray... If I am confused, I'm asking him to clear the confusion of my mind because I believe he can do, as Josh said earlier, bring the peace that passes all understanding. When I'm thankful, I give Jesus praise. I don't praise anybody else. When life is falling apart at the seams, I ask him to hold me together because he came, he lived, he died, he rose again, and that's the God I pray to. There's nothing generic about it. Amen. Amen. Woo! When we call on the name of Jesus when we pray, we are connected to spiritual power. Yeah, a few weeks ago when we were preaching on the fellowship part, I said, let's skip ahead, and we read verses 44 through 47. Today we're now going to go back and pick up verse 43. It's kind of like the third verse of a Methodist hymn. You know, it gets left out a lot. So we're going to go, we're going to pick up verse 43. And here's what we read that it says. A deep sense of awe came over them all, and the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders when they prayed in Jesus' name. Big things began to happen. Perhaps you remember how Peter was arrested. They were going to kill Peter for being a faithful disciple. And the people of God got together and they began to pray. And Peter's in a dungeon. And all of a sudden an angel appears and takes the chains off of Peter and gets him out of the prison. And he goes to this house where people are praying. He knocks on the door. A servant girl comes down and opens the door. And she goes, ah, it's Peter. And she slams the door in his face and goes upstairs and says, Peter's down there. And they say, well, let him in. Let him in. Whenever the people of God would get together and pray, we read in the book of Acts that after that moment, people began to come to faith in Christ. When God's people pray, powerful things happen. There was a church that had to get a new organ. An organ is this big instrument that people used to sing to whenever they came to church. I didn't want you to think they needed another kidney or anything, okay? And so they bought a new organ, and they invited a guest musician to come in and play the organ and show off how the organ worked. 
The pastor got up and introduced this person, and he went up to the organ, he sat on the bench, and he goes, and nothing happened. There was no sound. It was silent. Now, I'm here to tell you, friends, that is the kind of thing that strikes fear into the heart of a pastor. And not knowing what else to do, the pastor said, we need to pray. And somebody obviously made eye contact, but he called on somebody else to, to come pray. And while they were praying, and I'm sure it was a long prayer, and it was a, a pouring out of the, using the best King James English to pray, we beseech thee, O thou Father of all us peopleists. <laughs> and, and somebody who was church that day was a church custodian, and, and he knew what the problem was. They didn't turn the organ on. And so while this person's up there giving this passionate prayer, the custodian writes a note to the organist that says, don't worry, when the prayer is over, the power will be on. You hear that word? Beloved, when God created the church, God created it to be a people that prays. Jesus said... This is my Father's house. It is a house of prayer. And I don't know if you have a list or not. I'm not really concerned about that. What I'm concerned about is that you have the habit of prayer. The habit of spiritual exercise. The habit of aligning yourself with who Jesus is and the habit of being able to do what God has called you to do in the midst of spiritual power. Prayer is an unmistakable, vital part of what we as the people of God do whenever we gather together. And it's interesting to me. I don't know if, if y'all have ever noticed this. It's interesting to me that some places... People gather together to pray for rain, you know, agricultural stuff. We, we gather together to pray for rain, but nobody takes an umbrella. And so we kind of like to have teaching on prayer, and we kind of like hearing preaching on prayer, and then we give the benediction and go home. Does that seem odd to y'all? So guess what we're going to do? We're going to pray out loud where everybody can hear. I mean, if I invited you to a cover dish dinner, I suppose you'd come. So if y'all will just give a few moments for us to pray. And the way we're going to do this is not intimidating. Uh, it's actually an older form of prayer. We don't utilize it much, but it is a great habit of praying. And the prayer we're going to pray is one you're going to pray with your eyes open because you're going to have to be able to read the screen to join in this prayer. It's actually, parts of it are taken from, and parts of it are modeled from, the great litany that you can find in the Book of Common Prayer. So if you would take a moment to quiet your spirit and focus on who we're about to talk with, and then we will begin to pray. O God, the Father, creator of heaven and earth. O God, the Son, redeemer of the world. O God, the Holy Ghost, sanctifier of the faithful. O holy, blessed, and glorious Trinity, one God. Remember not, Lord Christ, our offenses, nor the offenses of our forebears. Neither reward us according to our sins. Spare us, good Lord. Spare your people that you have redeemed with your precious blood. From all evil and wickedness, from sin, from the crafts and assaults of the devil, and from everlasting damnation. Deliver us, good Lord, from blindness of heart, pride, hypocrisy, envy, hatred, and malice from all sinful affections and from all the deceits of the world, the flesh, and the devil. Deliver us from false doctrine and heresy. 
Deliver us from all lightning and storm, earthquake, fire, and flood, from plague, pestilence, and famine, from all oppression, conspiracy, and rebellion, from violence, battle, and murder. We ask you, O Lord God, to bless and guide those who lead your church. We ask you to bless and keep all your people. We ask that you send laborers into the harvest to draw people into your kingdom. We ask that you would give us hearts to love and serve you and to diligently keep your commandments. May it please you, good Lord, to make wars to cease in all the world, to give all nations peace so that all people may live in freedom. May it please you to show mercy on all prisoners and captives, the homeless and the hungry, and all who are desolate and oppressed. Hear us, good Lord, to forgive our enemies, persecutors, and slanderers, and may their hearts be turned to you. We ask, good Lord, that you would give us the gift of faith to do what you're calling us to do. May we seek only to bring glory to you, triune God, so that others are drawn to you for life, hope, and salvation. As you're able, would you stand as we sing?
And when we pray, we display his power. Go in peace.